artistic system will withstand the pressure of a growing new culture until the very foundation of art will be erected under the real laws of life. Until all artists will say with us, all is fiction, only life and its laws are authentic, and in life only the active is beautiful and wise and strong and right. For life does not know beauty as an aesthetic measure. Efficacious existence is the highest beauty. Life knows neither good nor bad nor justice as a measure of morals. Need is the highest and most just of all morals. Life does not know rationally abstracted truths as a measure of cognizance. Deed is the highest and surest of truths. Those are the laws of life. Can art withstand these laws if it is built on empty abstractions, on mirage, on fiction? We say, space and time are reborn to us today. Space and time are the only forms on which life is built and hence art must be constructed. States, political and economic systems perish. Ideas crumble under the strain of ages. But life is strong and grows and time goes on in its real continuity. Who will show us forms more efficacious than this? Who is the great one who will give us foundations stronger than this? Who is the genius who will tell us a legend more ravishing than the prosaic tale which is called life? The realization of our perceptions of the world in the form of space and time is the only aim of our pictorial and plastic art. In them we do not measure our works with the yardstick of beauty. We do not weigh them with pounds of tenderness and sentiments. The plumb line in our hand, eyes as precise as a ruler, in a spirit as taut as a compass, we construct our works as the universe constructs its own, as the engineer constructs its bridge, as the mathematician his formula of the orbits. We know that everything has its own essential image. Chair, table, lamp, telephone, book, house, man. They are all entire worlds with their own rhythms and their own orbits. That is why we, in creating things, take away from them the labels of their owners. All accidental and local, leaving only the reality of the constant rhythms of the forces in them. Thence, in painting, we renounce color as a pictorial element. Color is the idealized optical surface of objects, an exterior and superficial impression of them. Color is accidental, and it has nothing in common with the innermost essence of a thing. We affirm that the tone of a substance, i.e., its light absorbing material body is its only pictorial reality. We renounce in a line its descriptive value. In real life, there are no descriptive lines. Description is an accidental trace of a man on a thing. It is not bound up with the essential life and constant structure of the body. Descriptiveness is an element of a graphic illustration and decoration. We affirm the line only as a direction of the static forces in their rhythms 
in the object. We renounce volume as a pictorial and plastic form of space. One cannot measure space in volumes, as one cannot measure liquid in yards. Look at our space. What is it if not one continuous depth? We affirm depth as the only pictorial and plastic form of space. Four, we renounce in sculpture the mass as a sculptural element. It is known to every engineer that the static forces of a solid body and its material strength do not depend on the quantity of the mass. An example, a ray a T-beam, etc. But you, sculptors, of all shapes and directions, you still adhere to the age-old prejudice that you cannot free the volume of mass. Here in this exhibition, we take four planes and we construct with them the same volume as the four tons of mass. Thus, we bring back to sculpture the line as a direction, and in it we affirm depth as the one form of space. We renounce the thousand years old delusion in art that held that static rhythm eh, as the only element of the plastic and pictorial art. We affirm in uh, these art a new element, the kinetic rhythms, as the basic form of our perception of real time. These are the five fundamental principles of our work and our constructive technique. Today, we proclaim our work to you people in the squares and on the streets, we are placing our work convinced that art must not remain a sanctuary for the idle, a consolation for the weary, and a justification for the lazy. Art should attend us everywhere that life flows and acts, at the bench, at the table, at work, at rest, at play, on working days and holidays, at home and on the road, in order that the flame to leave should not extinguish in mankind.